Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on, you know, what has to be the most miserable, muggiest, shittiest day of the year. I think this is it. I know I said last week that we had reached peak Florida crap in terms of the humidity and the heat, but I was wrong. Uh, today is much, much worse. I don't know if it's because we just had a you know, the edge of a tropical storm blow through and we got a lot of rain and, you know, that rain is now getting baked up off of the ground. And But it is... It's just as bad as it gets, and I have absolutely had it. And, uh, you know, I know I moan and complain about the weather a lot, but I am telling you, if you could teleport yourself right here to where I'm standing right this moment and feel what it is I'm feeling, uh, you would understand the eternal and endless complaints uh, about the Florida weather in, um, in the middle of summer. So... Anyway, I'm going to persevere, and I'm going to get right into this car, which, you know, I would be enjoying a hell of a lot more if it was the middle of December, because the weather would be a lot better, and frankly, this car has no air conditioning. So, uh, you know, that has detracted somewhat from my enjoyment of it, which, honestly, I've never been much of a Beetle guy anyway, but uh, anyway, the hell with that. Let's just get into this thing. So this is a 1972 Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, this is a Super Beetle, actually, which uh, we'll get into, um, you know, as we go. Uh, I, I'm being a little bit incorrect in calling it a Beetle, because even though that is certainly how it is known around the world, uh, the truth of the matter is that this car was never officially named the Beetle. Uh, this was originally the Type 1, actually originally a Volkswagen uh, as a name, not as a manufacturer. Uh, type 1, it became the Volkswagen sedan at another point, uh, but uh, it never officially got uh, named or designated a model called the Beetle, actually until the, uh, the new Beetle came out in the late 1990s. But... Yeah, anyway, there it is. So this is, um, it, you know, the cars were made from 1938 all the way through 2003, one of the longest running platforms in global history. Uh, it was spiritually replaced by the new Beetle, uh, which came out in 1998, but not really. I mean, by that time, the car had already been replaced uh, by the VW Golf, essentially. Uh, if you remember the first GTI, which is now Uber Collectible, uh, those cars basically did take up the uh, take up the run, you know, carried the torch for the Beetle. Uh, but uh, anyway, when the new Beetle came out, you could call it the spiritual successor. Uh, Volkswagen, it translates directly to people's car. And uh, the first Beetles were given that name. Uh, it was the vision of none other than uh, Mr. Adolf Hitler himself. You know, it seems like I can't do a review on a German car without bringing up Hitler. But, uh, you know, more than any other car, uh, you have to give uh, have to give old Adolf some credit for the Beetle. Uh, I mean, it was basically his vision. The idea of a people's car did exist before Hitler, but uh, he did uh, create the atmosphere and the drive and the project to develop this particular car. Um, what he wanted was a simple, rugged, inexpensive vehicle to travel the new Reich bonds that uh, Germany was building. Uh, and uh, it was intended to modernize Germany. Uh, World War I had devastated them, devastated them in a way that it didn't the United States. And uh, as a result, uh, the German car market was basically mostly luxury cars. They, you know, were not about the people. And, uh, oh, in fact, only one in 50 Germans owned a car before uh, Beatles ever came out. So it was just something that was only for the rich, for the most part. Uh, and taking some inspiration from mutual admirer Henry Ford, uh, another guy who shared some of the same philosophies that Mr. Hitler did, uh, Adolf set out to build something akin to the Model T uh, that uh, had motorized America and would soon uh, motorize Germany. So in May of 34, he had a meeting with his preferred engineers and corporate heads, uh, chief amongst them uh, Mr. Ferdinand Porsche, who of course uh, has gone on to do other things. 
at least before he assumed room temperature. And uh, anyway, he insisted that there would be this basic vehicle that could be built that would transfer two adults and three children, which was the stereotypical Nazi family, <laughs> at 100 kilometers an hour while not using more than seven liters of gas to travel 100 kilometers, uh, roughly attaining 32 miles per gallon. And the engine had to be powerful enough for sustained cruising on the Autobahn at about 60 kilometers per hour. Uh, everything had to be designed to ensure that parts could quickly and uh, inexpensively be exchanged. The engine, he decided, should be air-cooled because, uh, as he said, not every country doctor had a garage. And I guess what he meant by that is, you know, the uh, coolant, antifreeze, uh, was not really a thing at the time. It was expensive and uh, used mostly in military applications. So if you had water in your radiator, it would freeze overnight in the harsh German winters and uh, the car wouldn't go, you know, unless it was kept inside in a heated garage or you refilled the thing every morning. So uh, air cooling was a way around that. Um, you know, interesting that he came up with that. Uh, but anyway, they set to work and uh, the head of the whole project was Ferdinand Porsche. Uh, some prototypes began to be built. They finally agreed on a specific design. And uh, on um, in May of 38, Hitler laid the cornerstone for the Volkswagen factory in what was then uh, Fallersleben, uh, later went on to be named, well, it's now a part of Wolfsburg, but uh, Wolfsburg wasn't a name then. Uh, he gave a speech in which he named the car the Kraft Dirch Freudwagen, or the Strength Through Joy car, uh, which, thank God, was abbreviated to the KDF wagon, because calling it the Strength Through Joy car just seems to have a little bit of a... Uh, <laughs> A little bit of a freakish connotation to it. You know, you really do have to love socialism, honest to God. Uh, but anyway, despite all of the showy public extravaganza and the idea that it was going to be deducted from the pay of average Germans, I mean, this car was going to be prolific. Uh, it was going to cost uh, under a thousand Reichsmarks, and they would sort of deduct it from your pay and uh, give it to you so you could drive around with your family. Well, they deducted. They got that part all right, but they didn't actually get the supply part all right. Uh, very few of them were initially made, and most of them were distributed to party elites. So, you know, this is, uh, there it is, that's socialism in a nutshell. Uh, but uh, so that didn't happen. The party elites, and in fact, Hitler, he got one of the first, uh, he got the first convertible. So, uh, it's hard to imagine, you know, this car that I sort of associate with young, attractive cheerleaders in high school uh, being driven around with. Uh, Adolf Hitler in the back seat, but of course it was different times. Uh, anyway, the war intervened with their production efforts, and they had to stop building the Beetle for the common man, and instead they started making military vehicles. Uh, the, kind of the first volume production of the car's running gear and chassis uh, was the Kubel Wagon, which uh, later went on to be known as the VW Thing, a favorite of surfers everywhere. And they also made a beautifully named thing called the Schwimm Wagon which was an amphibious vehicle, and God, wouldn't it have been cool if they actually decided to, <laughs> to make that on a commercial level. Uh, but um, anyway, so that's what they were doing during the war. None of this happened without scandal and intrigue, and I'm starting to understand that this is uh, something that, uh, despite their reputation for being very precise, you know, cold, what have you, is that the Germans are actually quite dramatic, you know, in the same way a pack of high school girls might be. Uh, a guy named Bella Baranyi is now credited with the original Beetle design, uh, but he had to go to court to get it. He went first to court to challenge patents held by uh, Ferdinand Porsche, and he showed technical drawings he had made in the mid-1920s, which were very, very Beetle-like. I mean, unquestionably Beetle-like, and uh, they did uh, predate anything uh, Ferdinand Porsche came up with by at least about five years. And in fact, Ferdinand Porsche had, um, had used uh, Mr. Burani as a, as a consultant, so it's not hard to see where he got the designs from. Uh, but anyway, that lawsuit was successful. He also sued Volkswagen uh, for copyright infringement, and that lawsuit was successful. So uh, as it is now, at least in the official history book, Spirani is credited with coming up with the original design, uh, and Ferdinand Porsche is just sort of, you know, 
the thought of as the guy who took it and ran with it. So that was uh, that was a change that happened. I don't know, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, so I'm just discovering that there are there's always scandal and drama with these Germans. But anyway, that's all on the side. Uh, after the award. Uh, phew, Oh God! You know, again with the coronavirus whiskey, it just it just does tend to make you a little bit loose-lipped and uh, ruins whatever plans you might have had, at least in terms of being coherent. So I'm going to try to get this right. But after the war, uh, the Allies, the uh, you know Ford and Chevy GM and some British makers led up by Roots, they were offered Volkswagen as uh, a war spoil, basically for free. Uh, you know, they could have had the factory. They could have had the name, they could have had everything. They turned it down. <laughs> they said, absolutely, this is a weird little piece of crap. It's noisy, it's annoying, it's not good for our customers. Uh, no thanks. So what has you know gone on to become one of the largest and occasionally the largest car manufacturer in the world uh, with some of the most incredible machines and a wide ranging uh, you know, group of manufacturers uh, was essentially turned down by the visionary in the U.S. and the um, and Britain for just being not what they wanted, and instead you've got a guy named Ivan Hurst. He was a British military officer, and he became tasked with bringing Volkswagen back from the dead. Uh, you know, after the war, uh, he had decided that the Germans needed jobs, which was obvious. You know, they had to do something, and uh, the occupying Allied forces needed cars. So he convinced. Uh, the British Army to order 20,000 of these things and he said about getting the factory back in shape uh, one of the first things that he had to do was remove an unexploded bomb that had fallen between two pretty critical pieces of the production elements and if that bomb had gone off or if he had set it off while removing it uh, that would have been the end of the beetle right there that would, <laughs> we'd never have heard of it it would have been gone uh, but that didn't happen and instead the uh, uh, the plant got back into shape. You know, they were working under limited production by law. They could only produce so many. And a lot of laws affected Germany after the war, uh, which is always tough on a country, I guess. But uh, they did quite well. They made uh, enough cars to um, uh, to work within what they'd been given to work with. And Hearst, in fact, came up with an export plan. Uh, they were doing that well, where they started sending some to Scandinavia. They started sending some... Uh, all around, and even though it was kind of, in, in Britain, forget it. I mean, this was thought of as Hitler's car. It, there was going to be no interest in it at all. But uh, in '49, they started sending it to the United States, and despite all predictions and odds, the car actually did quite well uh, right out of the gate. Uh, it started achieving popularity, and uh, I'm going to need about three minutes to dry myself off again because I, frankly, can't see anything uh, with the dripping and the humidity. So so uh, let me pause right there, then we'll get back into that. I just have to say, I mean, the humidity is unbelievable. It's just unbelievably shocking. And uh, my God, I don't know how the hell I'm going to get through this thing, but I'm going to try. Uh, anyway, it came to the United States in 1949 and sort of achieved an almost instant success. Uh, you know, out of the gate, it was selling pretty damn well. Uh, it could be credited to its size, the unusual shape, uh, which is actually quite pleasing to the eye. Uh, the engineering and the price point. Uh, there was a market for a compact car. People who were young, educated, more disposable income, uh, it defied Detroit. So, I mean, I guess you've basically got these sort of 50s, you know, hipsters who were thinking about embracing socialism. They didn't like the excesses of Detroit. They weren't a big fan of, you know, yay America and all that stuff. So they wanted to sort of embrace a counterculture. And this Beetle fit right into that. You know, a young PhD at uh, Dartmouth probably ended up buying one of these things because it, it showed that he wasn't a consumerist. And, you know, even if that's a little bit vomitorious, to me. I do understand it. And certainly uh, the excesses of Detroit in the 50s were pretty radical. Uh, but um, anyway, it did quite well through the 50s. And then in 1959, an ad agency named Doyle Dane Bird Bach, uh, or DDB, uh, took the Beetle and devised bold, honest ads, if you will, including the iconic Think Small. 
uh, which uh, has become one of the most famous. Ad. In fact, it was voted by, you know, in one of these things that rates such things. Uh, it was given an award as the best ad campaign uh, of the entire 20th century. So pretty big deal. And uh, many of the other ads that they came with, well, they, they were fun, they were interesting, they were honest, they were unusual, and they're uh, kind of neat even to look at today. So I'm going to uh, pause for a minute so I can interject a few of those over the top of the video. You can hear the birds in the meantime. Uh, anyway, you get into the 1960s and the Beatles is achieving even more success. All of a sudden, it's just about everywhere. Uh, it's all over Germany. I mean, in fact, Hitler's vision of these things running all over the Autobahns had come true uh, by 1960s Germany, uh, but not really in the same vein as what he envisioned. I mean, they weren't being run around by Nazi party affiliates with their families going off to vacation at the lake. Uh, you know, instead, they were just used by everyday Germans as transportation. And I think, you know, to the Germans, the car sort of represented a rebirth, uh, a normalcy. Uh, it had this sort of instantly recognizable silhouette, you know, the beetle shape. They were absolutely everywhere. And uh, it probably helped personify a healing country to the Germans. And it worked as an ambassador to the rest of the world. I mean, that's what it was for America. You know, uh, instead of representing Hitler's car, it was more or less a, a sign of Germany's recovery, and uh, it was embraced by this hippie counterculture, again, as a uh, rejection of consumerism. And then the uh, Beetle-derived bus, if you remember, of course, the uh, Volkswagen bus. I mean, probably the most iconic vehicle of that time, of the late 1960s, with all the, you know, filthy hippies running around in it, going to Woodstock, painting flowers on the side. Uh, you know, that uh, became... It's just, to me, it's absolutely fascinating that this vehicle that was sort of devised by Adolf Hitler becomes the go-to vehicle for the peace, love, and flowers counterculture in the United States just 20 years later. So, very, very strange. But uh, it became the best-selling car in the world. Uh, in 1968, Disney's The Love Bug came out and even further entrenched this thing in popular culture, even more so than it already was. And uh, in the 70s, it became the best-selling car of all time. It actually outpaced the Model T. And by 72, when this particular car was made, uh, they had made more than 15 million Beetles. So, uh, you know, what had started quite awkwardly and small had become one of the most iconic and influential cars uh, in the world. I mean, it was, it was globally recognizable. It was popular in Africa. It was popular in South America. It was it was everywhere. And uh, there was a, a universal love for the Beetle uh, by an uh, incredible amount of people that just perpetuated this for years and years and years. To the point, really, honestly, in, in a way even much more dramatic than the 9-11, uh, of course, with uh, which this, uh, well, the 9-11 is inspired by this car, if you will. Uh, but it held on for much longer than it should have. I mean, you're talking about a car that was made for like 80 years or something, which is just absolutely insane. Anyway, um, after the 70s, even though, you know, it had created these great um, benchmarks where it became the best-selling car of all time, a competition was creeping in. I mean, there was much more modern cars available that weren't based on something that was pre-war. Uh, Volkswagen itself was coming out with the Golf, which was intended to replace the Beetle, and uh, it was going to go forward from there. So uh, declining sales and, you know, lack of interest led to it being wrapped up in Europe and the United States by 1979. That said, like the Nazis that this car came from, it fled to Central and South America where it got a rebirthed popularity. And, you know, Mexico and Brazil went on to produce these things all the way through 2003. Uh, there's those little famous green and white taxi cabs that were all over Mexico. And uh, they loved them. They had an absolute love affair with the Beetle. Uh, so it just continued on and on. And I mean, again, it's absolutely amazing to think that versions of this car were made from, again, 1938, and it was conceived in 1926, mind you, uh, all the way through 2003. I mean, the car ran for a very, very long time. And, uh, 
Anyway, there it is. So this car is a Super Beetle, which was made to address some of the issues with the base Beetle. And again, I'm going to sort of pause the video there so I can get everything together, get ready to go. And uh, then we'll just go for a drive. And I, you know, thank God, because I'm going to find air conditioning uh, at the end of that trip. We've got some birds going crazy. I can hear they're answering and calling each other from across this car. Hopefully they stay up in the trees and no sign of Peter's cat to take out the birds, of course. <sighs> anyway, uh, this is a 1972 Super Beetle. And the Super Beetle was a vehicle that came out. I did not realize until I started researching to freshen up on it last night that the Super Beetle was offered at the same time as the base beetle. I thought it replaced it, but that is not the case. In fact, you could still get, apparently, a base beetle uh, while uh, the Super Beetle was available in 70. 71 and 72 are probably the best years for the Super Beetle uh, in terms of them looking the most like the... Um, uh, like the standard original Beetle uh, with just the right upgrades to make them a little bit more drivable. Uh, for one, they're a little bit bigger than the original. You can't really tell if you're just looking at it, but they are. Uh, the main difference is they switched in the front, and there's flies, of course. They switched in the front from a torsion bar setup to a McPherson strut setup, coilovers basically. And you know, if you ever want to know the difference between a Beetle and Super Beetle, just drive them. Drive the Beetle, <laughs> drive the Super Beetle, and you'll be stunned at the difference that uh, that that little change made. Uh, it did keep the torsion bars and trailing arms in the back, uh, but uh, up front it changed, and that was a pretty nice difference. Um, also, 7172, it kept the uh, same smaller taillights. Uh, in 73, it became those big elephant hoof looking things, uh, which frankly I think are a little bit awkward for the car. And uh, another key design feature, uh, 72 was the final year for a flat windshield, uh, which uh, again, I think is preferable to the curved one that came out. It's a very minor curve, but it's still there. Uh, but uh, the flat windshield sort of adds that vintage look, which I think is really, really cool. So. Anyway, let's just get into this thing. Uh, over the years, there were a variety of air-cooled engines and varying horsepowers. Uh, this one has a 1600cc dual port. I believe this to be a crate motor, by the way. I don't think it's the one that came with it. Uh, I think it was ordered as a complete motor. And man, does it run friggin' great. I mean, I have to say that when I took this car home, I wasn't entirely thrilled with the concept. I don't always love driving these older cars. For one reason, they tend to break on me a lot. You know, like I pull into 7-Eleven and that's when I find out that they don't like hot starting. Uh, you know, or in the morning I find out that they're very hard to cold start. Uh, this car didn't exhibit any of that, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, also, the transmission in it was rebuilt or, you know, ordered new at some point, And it shifts like butter, so it's actually just lovely to fire this car up and uh, and row it through the gears. Uh, the dual port, you can see when uh, you've got the um, uh, carb there up on top coming down into the intake and there going to the heads are those twin pipes and that's how you can recognize that it's a dual port. Uh, and what that does is free up the head to breathe a little bit smoother. You know, there's look, there's some fans of the single port, some fans of the dual port. It is what it is, but I, I think unquestionably uh, more airflow, more flow of, of any kind is just better for an engine and gives you more of what you want. So I think the dual port's probably the way to go. Uh, but anyway, and everything looking nice back here. You know, uh, talking about maintenance on Beetles, these engines can be fully removed in the space of like an hour and just put on a workbench. And uh, that was, of course, one of the reasons that people absolutely loved them at the time. The maintenance on these cars was just so simple and very, very different from all the other stuff coming out of Detroit. I mean, not that an old Chrysler engine wasn't, you know, tough to work on, but I, this thing was just ridiculous. I mean, in terms of simplicity, uh, it was an absolute piece of cake. And, uh, of course, that was one of the uh, design requirements at the time. So, let me get that back down, put my license plate on. I didn't bolt this one today. I've got it hanging from a bag, so... Got to push it around that, then we should be good. Have a look at the frunk. 
hate that word frunk. Okay, so here is another difference with the Super Beetle, is that you actually have room to put stuff. Uh, with the uh, base Beetle, the spare tire pretty much takes up the whole thing and that's it. Uh, Super Beetle, because it's a little bigger, uh, and of course because of the way the suspension is set up, uh, you have some room in the frunk. If you lift up this carpet, there you can see the spare is nestled behind it. Uh, this was a little bit ingenious, so it used the air pressure of the spare tire to pressurize the windshield washers and that's how they were able to spray uh, you know that was kind of the uh, make do German engineering at the time that was just pretty neat stuff uh, but anyway everything nice and proper under there and looks good I like the little towel with the beetle thing on it uh, I guess this one is finished in a color called butternut which frankly seems ludicrous, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. Uh, instead of a bumper, this thing has these little T-bars. You could also get Nerf bars. You know, this is all the stuff though. This one's done in more of a surfer style than a hippie style. Uh, you can see it's got the MP wheels, which look quite nice, the chrome MP wheels. Uh, it's got uh, traditional style roof rack that you could put surfboards on and other luggage, all very nice stuff. Uh, definitely, it's sitting a bit low. It has lowered front spindles, which uh, you know, let you use sort of more modern, low-profile tires while still looking pretty good. And uh, frankly, I just think the car has a very nice stance and look the way that it sits. Uh, another thing that I quite like on this one is somebody went to the trouble of putting rear disc brakes on it, uh, which of course it didn't come with. And uh, as a result, the braking on this car is pretty special. It's probably the best brakes I've ever felt in a Beetle. I don't think, look at all these flies. <sighs> Um, I don't think the brakes in a Beetle were ever particularly good, but, um, you know, for whatever, these, these particular brakes aren't particularly expensive, but uh, at least they went to the trouble of doing them, and I think it breaks pretty well as a result. Uh, the styling, you know, again, it's as iconic as any car ever made, and you can certainly see where the inspiration for the 911 came from. Uh, you know, little ass engine Nazi slot car, air-cooled, uh, pedals coming up off the floor, and uh, big round headlights in front, uh, but um, yeah, there it is. Um, Again, the little taillights are quite nice. The uh, little um, uh, the headlights are... You know, here's one thing that's interesting. Whoever redid this car apparently welded in all the holes for the trim. So you can see there's no VW badge where normally you'd see one. There's no trim down the side of the car or the front of the car. Uh, that's all been shaved. And, you know, that just fits with the... Um, uh, the way the VW uh, tuners and tweakers go. They all do these sort of neat little... Uh, tweaks that just make the cars more unique to them and I think it all works out pretty well and get a little bit of this window stuff going how the hell do you do this I don't think anyone's done that for a while I do like those little smoking windows they have I also have to say the build quality of this car is terrific. The way the doors close, the way they feel, uh, you can sort of understand that whole German engineering thing that people felt at the time. Uh, this is almost a Mercedes level build quality to me in uh, what is obviously a very sort of cheap and affordable car. And uh, of course that was a big part of their popularity. All right, in the back, you've got, uh, nice that it has the original seats in here. Uh, you know, I expected to see something else when I saw the car from a distance, but see a couple big six by nines in the back on a homemade package shelf. Uh, probably an MP package shelf. MP, by the way, is an age old Volkswagen tuner. Uh, it stands for European Motors Products. Inc. I think it became uh, European or sorry, Engineering Motors Products Inc. down the road or something. And initially, when it was out in the 50s, it was run by a couple of insane VW enthusiasts who, you know, made some pretty neat stuff, expensive and trick parts for these cars to make them more powerful and uh, also more stylish. And, um, you know, they're still around today. Pretty much anyone who has a Beetle knows about MP and has probably ordered parts from them. So it's more corporate than it used to be. The original enthusiasts are long gone, uh, but still a neat name. Uh, this one has uh, three-point shoulder belts, which is nice, and I suppose you could jam your three Canadians back there, and uh, I don't know how chipper they're going to be, but maybe chipper enough. Let's hop in. 
All right, and here you can see basically the same dashboard you'd find in a 930 Turbo. Oh, I'm kidding, but it it is funny how much it shares uh, with the air-cooled Porsches of the day. Uh, there you see one big video gauge that has the uh, fuel tank uh, reading built into it, the odometer. Uh, this one's showing 55,000 miles. Who the hell knows? You know, who know, how could you ever know the history of these things? Uh, technically, there's supposed to be a speaker behind here, but not anymore. Uh, that's when you might have got an AM, AM radio. Uh, this one is a Kenwood CD player built into the dash and apparently some kind of thing that I don't know how to use uh, where this little USB deal will give it different engine noises. So uh, through the speakers, it'll sound like a big black Chevy if you want it to. Kind of fascinating. Uh, glove box, nice stuff. You've got some receipts in there and uh, a couple of the pictures from uh, when the car was going through its uh, restoration. So that's kind of all nice to see. Uh, here's your light switch. Here's a fan. It, you know, this varies the uh, fan speed direction, that sort of thing. You've got your flashers here. Uh, I believe this is going to be an ashtray, but I'm not having any luck pulling it out. There we go. Try not to bust that. Uh, it has a cool little MP center console type device, which looks like your cups are going to fall immediately out of there. Uh, you've got your uh, pedals coming up off the floor, again, Porsche 911 style, and uh, a very famous uh, MP shifter. You'll see it in a lot of these cars with an eight ball shift knob. And I didn't change any of this. I just left it the way it was because, frankly, it's kind of cool. So, all right, let me give it a little toot, get ourselves a neutral, and let's see if this thing fires up. Fires right to life, sounds very air-cooled, sounds very nice. Uh, the absolutely unique sound from a Beetle uh, or a 911, you know, that you get. Uh, you can feel that it's at the back. You can hear the strange sound is definitely air-cooled. And, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just say there's not much else in the world that's like it. Uh, you know, one thing that surprised me about this car was how good it drived. Uh, oh my god. The nun that I had in second grade English class would murder me for that. Uh, <laughs> one thing that surprised me is how good it drives. Um, it really is shocking. I think that has something to do with the fact that it uses the lowered spindle. So to get the right height, it still gives you pretty good suspension travel. And uh, it's low, but it's not insanely low. So you still do get pretty good, uh, you know, reaction over the bumps and bounces. Uh, also being a super beetle, of course, helps. Oh my God. So you've got those McPherson struts soaking up the road. And this crate motor, God, for the love of God. <sighs> what is going on with that? There we go. Uh, this crate motor delivers really, really smooth power. The clutch is fairly new. And the car just drives like a million bucks, and it's peppy. I'm not even at full throttle there. And it just uh, doesn't seem to have any problem getting up to speed. So uh, I have to say, as far as Beatles go, this one surprised me. Uh, I was able to keep up with traffic. I didn't feel like I was in any way lacking for power. And uh, it just goes down the road really nice. So uh, credit some of that to the Super Beetle and credit some of that to the uh, crate motor and the otherwise good condition of this car, the maintenance. And braking wise, terrific. Uh, you know, obviously those rear disc brakes and uh, the uh, maintenance, you know, everything was obviously new when the car was redone. Uh, it brakes great, look at that. Straight line, no issues from the uh, steering at all, and just lovely. So, uh, this is one of the better driving Beetles that I've ever been in. Uh, we've sold a few Beetles over the years, and generally speaking, the way it goes is some guy comes in, sees the thing advertised, or sees it outside, decides he wants to relive his youth, uh, drives it for a couple of weeks, and then brings it back and says, Get this piece of shit out of my life. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I may have gotten my first BJ in one of these things, but it turns out that was 40 years ago, and uh, it doesn't have the same joy for me today that I guess it did back then. Uh, as far as that goes, I have to say this one's 
probably at the top of the heap. You may end up driving it for a month or two before you come to that conclusion. If this thing was air conditioned, I'd be much more chipper. I'd be actually giggling. So anyway, look, I won't ramble on and on. I think I've made the point about the Beetle. Uh, this one is for sale at Auto House of Naples. Uh, if you have an interest, give them a call, 239-263-8500, on the web at autohousenaples.com. Uh, thank you so much for having a look. Really appreciate it, and we will try to come up with something fun for the rest of the week. Take care.